All right, uh, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started. Um, thanks for joining us at Unreal Fest. Hope you're having a, a great time. Um, I wanna give a quick shout out to uh, Joe Finlayson, um, a friend and colleague, and hoping that we do justice to his panel today. And, and a shout out to all my colleagues who couldn't be here today. My name is Rob Defilia. I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for Film and TV at Epic Games. A little bit about my background. Um, I got into the industry in 1998. I'm aging myself a little bit. Um, started with some college buddies in the basement with Maya 1.0, Unreal, um, coincidentally, was, uh, was being launched at that time. Um, back then, as a small studio, um, we saw the potential of game technology and the potential of real time. Um, we explored real time shaders, but it wasn't quite mature enough. Uh, fast forward a few years, I moved to New Zealand and opened the animation facility, then jumped to the software side and uh, joined the team at uh, ShotGrid and Autodesk before I really feel like I came home to Epic Games and uh, I'd watched that journey of, of game engines and really seeing how they're disrupting the film and television industry. So now at Epic, I, I help studios that are uh, interested in real-time technology. Um, so set the table uh, today. We're really seeing um, real-time technology evolving across film and TV and animation and the camera and visual effects. And in each one of these um, uh, mediums, areas like previs and techvis play a really integral, integral role in the preparation and in the storytelling process. And um, Unreal Engine is helping make that previs faster and much more impactful. And this team here, so Crispy Media, um, they're being really innovative in the, in the space. So I want to introduce my guests. Micah Malinix uh, is the executive producer of So Crispy Media. Um, he's been developing projects that have gained hundreds of millions of views online uh, alongside some of the biggest names and brands and creators on the planet. Uh, most recently, they received a streaming award for the best VFX in 2022 for their work on Mr. Beast's Squid Game. It was pretty awesome. Um, some of his interests include real-time graphics, interactive entertainment, filmmaking, uh, gaming, and exploring how all those technologies are interwoven. Please welcome Micah. And his business partner, Sam Wickert, is the creative director at So Crispy Media. Um, he is a director and VFX supervisor who's worked closely with many clients, such as Epic Games, uh, Google Daydream, AMD, Blackmagic Design, Universal Orlando Resorts, uh, Red Bull and Discover. His most exciting projects are, on, are featured on his YouTube channel, So Crispy Media, which has accumulated over 2.3 million subscribers and 500 million plus views, most notably recognized from its web series, Chalk Warfare. Please welcome Sam. I want to play a little demo reel, uh, but first, welcome guys. Um, can you tell us a little bit about So Crispy Media? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, basically, our company is a visual effects company that we produce our own content. So we have our YouTube channel, which all of our work kind of has stemmed from that channel. And uh, we produce uh, high-end digital media visual effects content. We do commercials, film, uh, previs, and uh, tech viz as well. So we're going to be showing you a little bit of our work through this demo reel uh, that we're about to show. And we're going to be talking a lot about the previs and some of the work we've been doing, specifically using Unreal Engine today. Awesome. All right, let's take a look. Awesome. 
Um, all right, I want to start out talking a little bit about pipelines and kind of getting into Unreal Engines because pipelines are intimidating. Unreal Engine is super intimidating. Uh, how do you guys see for the people that, that are interested in getting into previs from students all the way through professionals, how do you re reduce the barrier to entry to kind of get into this, uh, this, this field? Yeah. Absolutely. So I can answer that first because I actually don't come from a super traditional background with VFX and a lot of that software. So I, when I started doing previous in Unreal, I was kind of like brand new into that space. So I view myself coming from a little bit more of like the enthusiast and student background and that was kind of my journey in. Um, and I would say generally like the biggest thing like we've done to get better at it and the way to get started is just download it and start using it. Honestly, like project-based learning is a huge way that we get better at our craft and we encourage a lot of our team um, to take on projects, personal projects, you know, do your own thing and just start to fail and keep failing and you eventually get better and better. Um, for something like Unreal too, like there's so many good online resources. Like, you know, I started out by watching honestly a ton of other YouTubers like teaching Unreal and teaching basic animation, teaching, you know, building simple environments. Um, you know, people like Unreal Sensei is a great one. I love his tutorials. I watch them a lot. Um, but things like that, that's how I got my journey going. And I think for anyone in the room who's maybe on that side of things, like just go and engage in tutorials and content and you can grow from there. Um, I'll let Sam speak maybe from people who are coming from a more professional background that are pivoting into Unreal from other software. Yeah, so one of the biggest things when we all, our team got involved with Unreal, it was actually due to the, uh, like the 2015 boom with VR. And we wanted to create uh, six degree of freedom experiences. So we were kind of introduced to this new technology. Uh, not, it wasn't really new technology, it was just game engine technology. And we were like, wait, you know, we're using all of these traditional pipelines Things take minutes to render, hours to render sometimes, depending on what you're doing. And here we have this you know, game engine that's doing some incredible work in the back end, and it's showing this in real time. So we started to get into virtual camera, we started to do all these things, and then realizing, oh my gosh, this is a tool that is getting so good that we're able to use it for previs, we're able to use it for our pipeline, and then on top of that, a lot of the time, like what we're doing now, is the quality standard of what we're able to produce out of Unreal is actually final pixel now in uh, a lot of the projects that we're able to do. So it's be kind of become this huge tool that our team has kind of adopted very early on just through the use of game development and then realizing that, oh my gosh, it can be used for so many other things. And to do that, uh, when we were learning, basically, it really, it really came down to a lot of the help docs and just the community. What's really cool is it's free to download and a lot of software that's free to download that, that have the I win, you win sort of uh, you know, mantra business model. Uh, it's, it's very nice because the communities are always very uh, you know, proactive and you're able to really learn a lot through yeah. the community. Yeah, and one other thing to add to that too is like um, this idea that this community is kind of fostering education is so cool because it's like everyone in this room too, it's like you guys can also contribute to that and that's gonna be helping somewhere, someone along the way. Um, you know, uh, traditionally it seems like a lot of people getting into animation, getting into previs, it's like, you know, there's really expensive software, with expensive licenses, and so the barrier to entry oftentimes is like, hey, go to a school, they'll give you the license, and then you can start learning. Um, but like, we're seeing, you know, today's world, there's YouTubers, there's TikTokers, there's people online who are in high school who are like, hey, I'm getting really good at this. Um, so if anyone in the room is familiar with like Blender, it's like we see that community and the internet community like pretty synonymous in some ways, and like, we love how much content is online where you can learn so much in Blender for free. Um, and so, yeah, it's like it's there and it's waiting for you guys. So in our mind, the barrier to entry is really low. <laughs> Just have a computer. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us about your pipeline, how it started, and how it has evolved to kind of what it is today. Yeah, so as I kind of briefly mentioned, like, you know, we have the traditional visual effects pipeline. Uh, we were, you know, we were obviously working on a lot of shots. Some of the stuff that we were going to be talking about today involves, you know, final pixel rendering. We have to go through it, the entire process. Uh, it, and oftentimes that starts with previs, getting the story across, and then moving all the way to actually uh, a production, and then shooting the footage, uh, motion tracking, doing everything, and then actually rendering out the, the, the footage, or the, the, you know, the renderings. So we, you know, we've been using Unreal through this process for all of those different uh, steps along the way. Uh, before it was a lot of different software that you kind of had have to bring together to be able to to pull these things off, but we're actually able to have something that looks really good <laughs> right at the beginning of the process when we jump in and just start world building. That's gotta be 
must be speeding up that process, oh, staying yeah. in a single package. Yeah, and with other tools like inside the Epic ecosystem, it's like these really great shortcuts exist. Things called like mega scans and metahumans and metahuman animator now, where you know the the speed to get to something presentable is getting faster and faster and faster. You know, no, we, long gone are the days of like having to build tons of custom assets for you know common elements in the world, and you, know, you can utilize mega scans to make things look really good. So, um, you know, kind of the bonus of integrating Unreal Engine in that pipeline is these other tools that are supporting it, um, and they're just reaching. You know, we'll get into some projects that the turnarounds are like stupid fast. So it's like the only way you can do those is like, hey, you're, we already have this library of amazing content, and, like we got to put it together and do it quick. Yeah, and to the point too with mega scans, like that was a software we were using before. Right. And, and it was so great that that was then you know, purchased to yeah. be able to implement into the engine and also implement in any other 3D program as well. Yeah. So you're using Unreal through your pipeline. Maybe you're just using Unreal for previs, but you know, these tools, are you're able to use it for everything. So yeah. it's, it's really cool. It's this ecosystem to be able to make your content. I'll, I'll pay you guys later. For <laughs> um, That's good. So you guys work on a, a wide range of projects, different styles, different uh, budgets, different time frames from Chalk Wars to The Last of Us. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit holistic, holistically on like why do you do previs? What is the importance of previs? We, we talked a lot about it, that there is a rationale and, and projects have different reasons and purposes. Um, I'd love to just kind of get your perspective of that and like why people should be doing it. And then I'd love to just walk through some and some examples of you guys work and you can kind of talk through, you know, what was the reason here, what you got out of it and, and kind of that process. Yeah. yeah. So I would say like, you know, generally speaking, each project has a totally different need. You know, um, Previs is a process in this greater pipeline. Um, but you know, for the most part, we kind of tailor fit a lot of our Previs towards what are the needs of the project, if it's our project versus if it's a client project. Um, but generally speaking, like, you know, there's similar processes that are set up and established from the get-go. So like, you know, um, we have to start with the creative. The creative always leads. And so it's like, are, there, are we storyboarding? Are there storyboards? You know, on our team, we don't have like a dedicated storyboard artist. So sometimes like we're de developing the visuals for the first time inside previs. Um, or examples I like to use is uh, Sam will occasionally, when he's directing something, we'll draw stick figures. And we have these big pieces of paper of stick figures. And that's kind of our process to establish the cameras and placement. And then that's migrating into um, previs. But again, it totally depends on the project. Um, and and so, you know, we, you kind of have to adapt and pivot. And the projects we're going to discuss all kind of have unique use cases about when and where and why to previs. Yeah, and the biggest thing for previs is obviously just to get the look, the flow, and the timing down. And it's to get everybody on the same page, because unfortunately, we don't all like have neural links in our brain where we can beam our thoughts to everybody, right? That'd be great if we did. But, uh, you know, when, when there's a factor of, being on a production and you know, if I'm directing a piece of content and I need everybody to be on the same page so that we can effectively film something in the amount of time that we have uh, and not you know, waste time and obviously resources, money, everything. Yeah. Uh, Previs is a tool that will allow us to be able to get you know, on, that, uh, on the same page. And that's really what we've taken upon ourselves with Unreal is jumping in because you have something that just looks so great from the beginning. And, uh, the, the tools are there to be able to, to get that vision across. Yeah. Before we jump in, I want to backtrack a little bit because like, it's clear. It makes sense. You're doing a big movie or something. That planning process is so critical. But we touched on TikTok and YouTube and those things. Yeah. You know, there's still, you know, do you still see a benefit of that type of planning at lower level, smaller scale things? And, and are you guys seeing that out there? Yeah, so I mean, the short answer is it, it depends, but largely it's something that, that's a space that's growing a lot. So like you might not see or know this, but like there are very, you know, there's YouTube content online and people are using Unreal and previsioning stuff for that content. Um, even if it's as simple as like, hey, me and my buddies have a YouTube channel with half a million subscribers and we're making these cool films and we're using Unreal to block out the environments, block out the room, or a streamer is designing his virtual space and, you know, and building a virtual environment that is putting behind him on a green screen. Like that kind of stuff is, it's really, interesting to see how Unreal is integrating there. But um, as far as previous specifically goes, um, we're seeing that you know, from everything from simple blockouts to, I mean, on our end, making like high-end action films, like we previs very heavily for our channel. Um, but it's something that's growing. Um, and we're seeing as more and more people are using Unreal Engine for Final Pixel, the previs process is like a no-brainer because you're going to be doing that process anyways if you're animating, if you're designing environments. So why not start that sooner than later? Yeah, you really, it really makes you realize how much, uh, you know, directorial advice that a previous artist can give to a piece of content. Like, 
there's a lot of autonomy and a lot of uh, decision making that happens so early on, and it's very cool to be part of that you know beginning process. And we can talk about that a little bit when we get to our stuff with HBO. Yeah. But you know, people on our team that we're basically getting so used to these tools and using Unreal that we jump in and we go, oh, I didn't think of that. Like, oh, that's what it looks like on a, a 50 millimeter yeah. lens versus, you know. So you're able to just jump in, it's like a sandbox. It's like, it's like mm -hmm. you're on set, it's like, except you didn't have to leave the office, yeah. right? <laughs> Love it. Um, let's start with Chalk Warfare. This is one of your uh, own IPs. Give us a little bit of a background on what it is and then I'll go and we'll play uh, some side by sides. You guys can talk through that process. Yeah. Sure, so this is one of our biggest series. It's called Chalk Warfare and it involves teams uh, drawing weapons with chalk, pulling them out of the wall. Uh, it's uh, one of our you know, favorite series that we've worked on. We've been making them for years on YouTube and uh, you know, it's got a huge fan base behind it. And this was the most recent one we did and it had to, it's the fourth one of the series. It had to one up every other one we had to do. Uh, and there is a lot involved with this, including a full skydive sequence that was actually shot for real. Now this was our first, you know, we, we were not pre at this time, and so this was some of our first rudimentary pre -vis. but you can show how it exactly follows what we needed to do, because I had to show these 15, uh, or 16 individuals that were skydiving who had 50 seconds each run, so basically 30 seconds after dropping to get into position, what to do, <laughs> yeah. and we use this as a tool to show it. And this is, again, is very early on, but it just shows the look, the feel, and the, the shots we needed to get. Yeah. And you can, then you can see with the future content that we're gonna be showing you how much this changed when we started utilizing previs more and more. Yeah, especially for things like stunts, like, like if you're gonna start you know, prevising or if you're gonna have a totem pole of priority, stunts and action sequences are so high up on that list. Um, you know, as the producer on this project, when Sam came to me and was like, hey, I wanna have an opening skydiving sequence, I'm like, what? Were you <laughs> dude, we're YouTubers, like, we don't have these crazy budgets. So the approach we took was like, hey, we developed this previs, we look at it, we shared that with these stunt, you know, stunt skydivers, and they're like, hey, yeah, we actually think we can do this. And you know, we build upon that process, and you know, that process would have been totally halted if we didn't have something to reference and show them. Um, and then that also goes into the safety of the element, where these skydivers all need to be choreographed and coordinating, and you know, they had all that, and they could all understand what each other was doing. So when one of them was like falling in the air, falling, like they all knew, oh, that's part of the plan. Yeah. So there's elements like this that just they're so essential and you just you have to pre it. Yeah, and this is again the most rudimentary version of what this yeah. looks like, right? This is this is the minimum viable product was never anything that we would be showing. Mm -hmm. And you'll see how much it can change and be improved. Yeah. How many easily. jumps? How many jumps did they do? We, we had four jumps. Four okay. jumps. Yeah. So we got it all. Uh, I actually went for one of them. Yeah, it was on the yeah, that That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Then moving up, you talk about kind of we're going to go from uh, from lower res and, and a little bit more in depth um, yeah. um, previs. This is uh, movie effects gone wrong. Uh, give us a little background on that, and then we'll do some more side. Yeah. So this was a project our company did with Samsung, and it had a ton of visual effects in it. And it, one of the most important things we wanted to do was previs for the sequence that we were doing, but we had a huge set change day of. So at our team, we had this previs made in like an hour to be able to show all the team the new, the new, uh, you know, the new previs for what we were gonna film. And a lot of this was ultimately then done in CG. But you can see this on the left is done in Unreal just very quickly, extremely quickly. Yeah, and it's cool because like, Working in that previs and working on a production that had a pretty fast turnaround, like that previs helps inform the production on so many decisions on like what is the feel, what is the flow, is this working, is this not working? Um, and again, it's it's stuff like that, like that's going to make or break the scene. You know what I mean? Like this, we have a super cool end result on the right there, and, and that exists largely because um, you know we were able to push the previs a little further than we'd done previously, where we can say, does this feel right? Is this giant robot cool and intimidating, or is this underwhelming? And you know, so you you have to kind of increase the benchmark more to make to answer those questions. Um, we wouldn't know if this looks cool or not from the previs if it was, you know, PlayStation 1 robot attack. It, it doesn't land the same way. Um, so things like that really help support kind of our goals as filmmakers. And, and the purpose of this previs really is to help us answer questions before we spend all the money on the VFX or before we enter production. Yeah, a lot of decisions were made from this. And you can see, because it obviously doesn't match one to one. Like we, mm -hmm. we made decisions where we're like, oh, that's, no, we don't like that, that's lame. Let's, let's not yeah. do it, but we saw the, the most minimum viable product yeah. of that. Do you want to talk a little bit about, too, even like why banana peels instead of spikes? Because initially, it was a good choice. Yeah, the, vi was a really the, good the vision choice. was like, oh, crazy cool spikes yeah, that, through. So it. that was actually a visual effects uh, timeline thing. You know, we, we looked at it and then we judged 
after we saw it, we were like, oh, this would be really cool, but we were gonna have complete uh, you know, simulation of the ground, concrete coming up, and you, know, you could see underneath the ground, all sorts of stuff, so there's a lot of physics sims. And we realized the banana would be just a more fun little yeah. element, and it would be a little more brand friendly as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> sure, can't, can't argue that. Who doesn't love Meyer Kart, so <laughs> thanks a lot, Meyer. I love it. All right, now we're going up a huge notch. Um, Last of Us, I think everybody knows <laughs> about that show. Um, but talk us about your experience, what you guys were asked to do, and, and, uh, and I've got a couple different takes here um, that you can talk us through the, the different process. Yeah, so what you're gonna see here is a much more polished version of our, our previs that, you know, it was done for the purpose of, you know, they, there was this huge scene that needed to be filmed for The Last of Us. This was very early on, it was about three years ago now at this point. Yeah. Um, COVID restrictions were now in place. Uh, you know, every, the, the productions were opened up to filming. And uh, the team was looking for a very unique way to get a director and a director of photography who had never shot with visual effects before, a way to get like a hands-on experience, but they were in COVID lockdowns in Calgary, Canada. So we uh, basically built with Unreal Engine an entire uh, world, right? And we were able to do live previs on Zoom calls. Over the uh, over the internet, and what you can see here is us, you know, piping this in live with all the tools that Unreal has to offer with virtual camera uh, tracking to be able to get the different views. So right here, you can see this is the sequence where they are driving through uh, Calgary, and uh, Sarah's in the back seat, and there's a plane that ultimately crashes. Yeah. And you can see me looking at this plane that literally flies right over. So all these were triggered events in Unreal Engine. Yeah. And what's cool about this too is, I mean, as you can imagine, a show of this scale is just totally, totally different than a lot of our content. And so um, the creative collaboration also looked totally different. You know, we are really, our goal is serving the creatives on this. It's not our baby, it's theirs. Um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time just working with them to figure out what can we do to make your guys' lives easier? What can we do to support your guys' vision? Um, and, you know, and it goes hand in hand. Like, you know, we start with the script, we look at that, you know, we ask questions, they give us storyboards, and then our goal is, is to go in and look at these storyboards and be like, you know, this is amazing, what can we do to make it as amazing, and is there anything we can do to like just ladder that up a little bit more? And, and so we're spending a lot of time, you know, working in their vision and just trying to empower that, um, which is really fun. I mean, this whole process, it, it's, it was awesome working with their team. It's very collaborative. They gave us a lot of, you know, flexibility to control virtual cameras and say, hey, you know, what if, you know, Sam was operating, what if we try this, what if we try this? Um, and in this little clip here, you can even see um, we're able to help inform some decisions even on cost saving mechanisms of like, um, Sam, I'll let you speak to this, but like, yeah, there, you know, there blowing a, up planes is expensive. Yeah, there is, there is a moment where there was just curious, on call, where they're just curious, like, hey, what would it look like if we're over the building to the left so we just see a light instead yeah. of having a huge explosion? It's like, we know that would be a lot cheaper. And then they saw it and they go, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah but so, you get to see it, right? You see yeah. it from the perspective of the car. That's the actual, you know, photo scan yeah. of the town. So yeah. everything is a scene before it's even shot. And one of those things too is like, again, when you're working on previs, it's like you are not on an island. Like the previs is serving a project, so you are in a production, and then that, pro that production is going to go into post-production. So it's like one of you know, the tips we tell our team and just anyone who's getting into previs is like, it benefits a ton if you can understand some base level of VFX if you're working on a high-end VFX you know, piece of content. You know, it works really well if you can save the production, you know, some, some strain and be able to kind of inform decisions for them. I mean, again, even on this project, it's like you see all those zombies running around in the scene when we'll get to it in a second, but we can help answer questions to be like, hey, you guys might be able to do 35 zombies instead of 65 zombies if you rearrange them here. And then, you know, the producers on the project are like, thank you so much, you saved us so much money. So things like that, it's like you really can get in the headspace to help inform that. Um, and again, as he's mentioning, on the VFX side, having knowledge of VFX is so useful to help previous sequences like this, because you can save them time and energy up front. On Chalk Wars and those type of projects that they're own, it's obvious you're put injecting your creative energy in there. Um, Mike, you talked about, look, you're, you're trying to translate the directors that you're working with, their image, but there's gotta be a level, and it's gotta be fun and, and, and creatively rewarding that you guys are injecting a lot of your DNA in here and, and having that opportunity, I would imagine. And you know, how is that process? You feel that collaboration? Well, what's awesome? really in particular is because we're using Unreal Engine, this isn't something that's happening through like iterative notes, yeah. right? <laughs> in the traditional process, it would be like, okay, we, you know, we do it in a traditional pipeline, we render it as a play blast, it's edited, it's got everything to it, and you send it off, you can, then we would receive, receive notes on it, yeah. and then however long it is that the team then puts it back together. 
but this was a three hour Zoom call. Yeah. And there was a, there was a decision right off the bat, okay, let's see different lens options, yeah. right? Yeah. We're on the RE Leon LF film back right there and we're able to see, okay, what is it, what's it gonna look like when we're you know, on yeah. a 15? What's it gonna look like when we're on a 25? Um, so it, the collaboration was heightened to like such a high degree by, awesome. by being able to do it live yep. versus you know, through notes. Yeah, no, yeah. that's yeah. terrible, that's great. And I, I mean, the speed of turnaround is just yeah. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, and keep in mind too, it's like, what was able to, we were able to service that really well and it's it like, you have to keep in mind the purpose of the project is there. Um, and what we want to do is serve the purpose of the project. And in this scenario, it's, you know, we want to help make real time decisions with them because this was also, this project was moving very quickly and yeah. we just didn't have time, like we didn't have time for them to give, you know, five different passes on like, oh, rendered out, oh, here's a 35, here's a 50. It's like, we could solve what would have been a few days of notes back and forth with a three hour Zoom call where you can just dial it in on the spot. And in a more unique way because, yeah. you know, having an actor that's live on, on set, yeah. Right? you yeah. could say, okay, wait, let me see what that lens looks like. Turn your head real quick. Yeah. And they turn the head and you yeah. can see live in camera. So you know, in we, camera, yeah, right? we found that the, the DP and the director, yeah, had a great time doing that because yeah. it's like, you know, they can be so involved in that process where normally they just have to leave yeah. frame my own notes. <laughs> awesome. All right, I'm gonna cut to uh, the, the full sequence. Yep. You guys talk through. Yeah, you know, we want to hear more about zombies. So. Absolutely. So, if you are, if you recognize from the show, so this is the sequence where one of the, the pivotal sequences where Sarah's in the back seat of the truck when they're driving, and the uh, zombie outbreak is just now happening. So you can see a lot of interesting information here on the screen. You can see, I, like, we've got down to the exact tenth of a kilometer per hour of how fast the stunt driver is supposed to be driving through town, uh, and obviously also uh, the version number and the uh, focal length. But this, is, this was pretty much mapped one to one. So we have before and afters that we have of this, but if you've seen the show, you might yeah. recognize this. And some of the other cool things that like, again, we're factoring into just as the previous team informing production, it's like real world scale on the city is super important because like how useful is this? You know, it's a lot less useful if you're just kind of making up the, the city blocks. So it's like, you know, go into that thing. And then as I was talking about too, it's like you're factoring in visually, how many people do we need to see on screen? What can we convey? Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about it too, and like one of the beauties of previs is like, you know, it's a supporting role in a lot of ways, you know, at the end of the day, they might want to add in more zombies when they're on set and they can totally do that and it's okay. But you know, you don't have the pressure as a previous artist to have to be thinking like, oh goodness, this is going to be it. This is final. Like there's always room to even expand the previs, even if your previs is already really good. Yeah. And what also it's important to note too, like one of the big things is a lot of the technicals here would be referred to as tech viz. Yeah. So this is not only previs, but it's also tech viz. So it's, is it possible? And yeah. how is it possible? What's the, you know, you would give distances of the camera, everything. And that's very cool to do in Unreal Engine versus another uh, traditional program because Unreal Engine has the ability to code inside of it very easily. So a lot of this stuff is actually able to just pop up as a, you know, like a video game HUD on top of everything. So you can have the speed and everything displayed. Yeah, and, and I think that's an interesting thing is, you know, when I first see stuff and see, you know, some layouts, previs, you know, you're kind of just throwing things together. And I imagine there are some scenarios and some shows where it doesn't really matter that this is 10 feet away or I'm driving the speed, but yeah. there are shows like this. This is a, a very intricate choreographed scene that you said you had the full scan, everything was to scale, and you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot more considerations there, I imagine, in, in, for a very technical previs versus yep. something that's loose. And again, as I was like talking about too, like we saw that motorcycle driver drive through. It's like you know, this car is a stunt car. That motorcycle, stunt motorcycle. It's like you know, safety is so important on set. And so it's like we want to make sure this is even realistic, and we can say, hey, stunt drivers, you know, we can confidently tell you, you should drive this speed. That's what production thinks is safe. They've cleared it, and everyone's you know referencing this to kind of know what the game plan yeah. is. You can also then lift the camera up, go in an omniscient view, show like, oh, this is where we're going to put the ramp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For them to take off. Yeah. So. So no zombies were hurt in the filming of this previs. As far as we know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Anything on The Last of Us or we move on to should we move on to the next? I think we're good to move on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Carl Gummies, uh, talk us through it. Then this is, this again, uh, you talk about the levels of getting more detailed and having to put more, more into um, your your previous process and time, budget, those things are considerations. What was the scenario on Carl Gummies and, and talk us through what it is? Yeah, so we work a lot with the Mr. Beast team and uh, Feastables in particular is a brand that they have uh, and they were announcing this new Gummies product called Carl Gummies 
uh, and Carl Jacobs is one of the individuals that was behind this you know, product. And they had this crazy idea of wanting to send them to the moon, right? So this is an example of something that was a two week turnaround. Yeah, it was two extremely or three fast. So it was a, a minute long commercial uh, delivered in both nine by 16 and also 16 by nine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was uh, actually all, it was all rendered basically. Yeah. And we were able to then deliver both those formats. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we created the previs uh, very quickly again, yeah. but this one has you know great fidelity, and we matched it one to one basically as mm -hmm. the you know the pitch viz, yep. the yeah. uh, the ability to know exactly what we're doing on set, and we were able to show up and just film this thing yeah. to a T, exactly what we needed to so, do. Yeah, this is a really good example of like you know <laughs> the fidelity. There's almost like a correlation of like the faster your turnaround is on a project, the higher the fidelity needs to be because um, you know you kind of just have to get it right. Um, and so when they kind of a, you know when they say hey we this thing comes out in a month. You know, you, you guys have two weeks of post-production and it's a f almost full CG ad. You know, in our minds, it's like you have to go in real time and you have to go in and, and make this previs, not just previs, but it's pitch viz as well because we're designing this full 60 second previs and we're telling the creative team like, <laughs> what you see is what you're gonna get. You know, it'll be higher fidelity and we'll have, you know, real actors instead of, you know, CG actors, but that needs to lock and so we were, in, in previs, we were working on editorial, we were working on sound design, we were working on mood. Um, you know, we, again, we were given storyboards to work with, which is a huge help if you're doing previs. Um, but we knew from the get-go, we would have kind of a hero master asset going into production, that come production day, we can just print out every frame of the previs, more or less, and just shoot that identical. Um, so that's basically how it kind of came about, and we were fortunate to be able to turn around 60 seconds of full, crazy rendered CG in a two-week pipeline because of it. You've got the lines in the previs, so. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times we don't have any audio for previs. Yeah. yeah. This, this is a cool one, though, where um, if we did have sound playing, there's like, again, there's full sound design within uh, the previs, which is like unconventional in a lot of ways. If you're traditionally working in previs, it's kind of not necessary in some ways. Um, but for this one, we found that it was pretty important because um, Sound design is also, it's very important, especially in like a space piece, because you need to kind of define what that looks like, how that feels, um, and then the music too is, it plays a huge part in it. Um, but yeah, what you're seeing here is a lot of, um, kind of again, more close to final previs relative to um, what we did in production. Yeah. Um, I, I, like to, I always like to go back to the, to the creative and you talk about pitch viz, and again, you, we talked yesterday and you're saying, look, you did get storyboards, your director gave you a vision, but this is a fast turnaround that really you guys are taking that and you are informing them and, and, and pitching back what, what your vision is of their vision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. And you know, that whole process, you could dive way further into that, but it's very collaborative because um, you know, from the director and the representative over from Feastable is like, they have a really clear vision of what they want. And so um, we found that, again, this previs process was very involved because we're effectively editing a final video in previs. Um, and being able to iterate, that, iterate and do that really quickly in Unreal was awesome because um, for the back end of this one, we used more traditional offline rendering process. So um, the, the speed advantage was totally on the front end with Unreal. And we didn't really have the fortune to do that on the back end as much. So um, being able to iterate that previs early on was also really great. Um, and yeah, we were able just to eventually land the plane once we knew what we needed. That's awesome. Uh, so we, we looked at a lot of scripted shows. Um, you guys also do a lot of non-scripted shows like, uh, like Mr. Beast. Is there a difference in your approach with previs and tech viz for a scripted versus non-scripted show? Yeah, at the end of the day, it's pretty similar, but the, the big thing is that you're really just, you have one shot at it, right? You're not, you're not gonna do retakes. Uh, it's, you're, you're filming IRL entertainment. Uh, so one of the fun things is that when we would go on set for these, uh, you know, real life, uh, you know, pre-visualization sessions, you can basically set up every different camera point on that set because it's basically the holistic world that you are filming. Uh, you're not really cheating anything. You're not like switching locations halfway through. Mm -hmm. So the, it really came down to tech viz at a lot of, uh, that, that became kind of the more important thing for a lot of the, uh, the script or non-scripted stuff we would work on. So it would be like, oh, how high does the camera need to be? What is that gonna look like? Can we see what that looks like? And sometimes it's even uh, going on set with the virtual camera yeah. plugged up into Unreal Engine and then you can look through the monitor and you actually see, you know, like a augmented reality version of, oh gosh, like there is the, the real set. This is what I'm gonna be looking at. This is what it's gonna look like when people are doing this yeah. you know, event. Yeah, pre something like, you know, for example, like the Mr. Beast Squid Game project, um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of decision making 
you don't have to make if you're doing it in scripted. So you know, again, we don't really care about animation as much because we have no idea what these contestants are going to be doing. We don't know where they're going to be in the room. Um, we're not structuring sequences in that way because nobody knows yet. <laughs> like we're going to find out what we get, you know, when when they film it in real life. Um, but the advantages that we do gain in some ways from doing the non-scripted is, um, you know, it allows us to really craft and understand like where camera placement needs to be. Um, specifically, if we're doing VFX on the back end of the video, the camera placement is essential. It's absolutely crucial because sometimes a placement of a camera can be the difference of you know, 30 hours of, on one shot or five hours on one shot. And so you can play the math game quite a bit, um, but at the end of the day, on these projects with also very fast turnarounds, you know, the objective here is we go in, we work with the camera team, we work with the creative team, and we say, this is what the set's gonna look like in CG. We're gonna put the cameras here, um, and we're gonna film it and we're gonna hope no one does anything stupid. <laughs> and you know, more often than not, it ends up being okay. Um, but it also just goes to show, in some regards, there's kind of a lesson there where you can't plan everything and even your best previs is never going to solve all your problems. Um, so there's some more lessons in that of do the best you can with what you have and on those projects, you know, the best we can do is place cameras and make a CG set and hope for the best. I want to touch on the future of Previs, where you guys think it's going, and in a, in a couple, couple different ways. So first, you know, Previs as in a traditional sense, a traditional, non-traditional sense, do you, do you see Previs becoming more interactive, more collaborative, and, and how Unreal uh, as a technology feeds into that? And then second, I want to go into uh, some of the benefits of using UE um, we, we talk about things like transmedia this, and being able to leverage your assets in, in different mediums. Like, how is, how is Previs feeding into that? Um, does it? And again, some of our other tools like UAFN, are, are there opportunities there? So, it's a lot to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd uh, love to hear you guys' Yeah, thoughts. I mean, we've touched a little bit on it, but it, it really makes a big difference mm -hmm. having this, you know, the, the tools available because it's a game engine. Yeah. And there's just so many opportunities to have, you know, the, the blueprint structure, if you need to go in and do some C++ work, you can do that all in engine. Uh, and then you have all the, all the functions that make a game, right, to be able to implement into the previs. But then on top of that, you know, you're in this ecosystem where you can, you don't, you're not just limited to exporting still frames. And, you know, this is something that Micah and I have long been wanting to do with our content is because we're in this engine, uh, yeah. we're able to make media that's not necessarily just baked down to 2D frames. Yeah, it's cool because, again, you're working in these full game engine 3D environments, and we're gonna show some stuff here, but it's fascinating because you can kind of wonder, like, well, what if? What if we took our previs set and turned it into a game? Yeah. <laughs> or what if we you know, designed something, and like, how else can you use it, and how can you share those assets? So this is something Sam put together after our Squid Game, and this is pre-UEFN, this is pre, you know, any of that like new technology, this is just, we took blueprints and we added a player character into our previs and turned it into a game. And it proved the, you know, the model of, hey, we made, th we made this thing, we used this, this bridge asset to create uh, a piece of content, yeah. and then we turned it into a little video game. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problem, though, <laughs> was that there's really not a great way to distribute yeah. the games, right? You can obviously put it on you know, Steam or whatnot, but there's a lot of back-end work that had to be done to do this versus just being able to easily export it. Uh, and this was before uh, yeah. all this new great stuff that's coming out. Being a team of like primarily artists, we look at things like deployment, optimization, distribution, and we like cringe because we don't have no idea. That's not our expertise in the same way of like designing visuals and designing you know, all the art. Um, so yeah, we're excited to see like some more of the future and where that's gonna go. Um, and one other cool thing about this, specifically the, the Squid Game one, uh, sorry, go <laughs> ahead. Um, so what's cool about this, one thing to note also is this was both previs and also it was the final pixel and it's also a transmedia experience so we used the more or less same environment to previs it because we knew at the beginning of that project that we were going to do final pixel for it. Um, All right, talk us through this next. So this is the next generation, right? Yeah. We are now using UEFN uh, to do this in a similar regard, but this is an interactive ability to show the previs all in Unreal Engine and also then show what the set build was gonna look like. Yeah. And it's all in this experience. So it's, it's kind of like, it answers the question of like, is it possible to previs in UEFN? And you know, there's a lot of limitations and it's not something we'd say, you know, jump into yet, but there's a future where that's gonna become more and more real. And the excitement you get is like, you can now open up opportunities like this where you can take your previs set, you can play the previs sequence. And if you want to, you can now blast alien monsters all in the same project file. So it opens up a lot of opportunity and a lot of excitement for 
this idea of transmedia and this idea of like, you know, what is the future gonna hold? Like, you know, this is gonna become more and more interactive in time. Um, and again, not to say this is serving any use for previs, but it's super freaking cool. And we're like, there's totally some fun stuff you can do with here where, you know, maybe the client project you're working on, you're doing previs for it, and then you can sell them on the idea of like, hey, we built your entire set in 3D, you could, put this out in Fortnite if you really want to. Yeah, I mean, this was, a, this, as a content creator, this was a dream of ours, yes. right? Like, we always wanted to produce video games and produce them alongside our pieces of content, Yeah. right? You spend two years making something that's 30 minutes long, or mm -hmm. people will watch it, you know, maybe several times if you're lucky, or you can make something people spend hundreds of hours in that's very rewarding to, as a creator, and you're doing a lot of the same assets. So this ease of being able to create in, in games is, is quite cool. I think you covered it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, Sam, Micah, thank you guys so much for uh, joining us. We really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, round of applause and enjoy the rest of Unreal Fest.